Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frank Schröder. Um, I work for the eBay Classifieds group here in Amsterdam, and today I want to talk to you about Fabio, uh, a fast modern HTTP router I've uh, written in Go. Um, so I think the first question that you could ask yourself is, you know, why would anybody in, in 2015, 2016 write a new HTTP load balancer if we already have a shitload of them out there? So, I mean, we have Nginx, we have Apache, we have uh, Squid, Varnish, uh, those, the battle-tested uh, battle tools um, that have been around for a long time. They have, like, shitloads of features. Uh, we have uh, um, expensive appliances that we can use in our corporate environments, like the Big IP and the NetScaler. And there are also um, other tools out there, uh, like Traffic and Vulkan, which are more, also more in the modern HTTP load balancer space. So the primary reason is that um, uh, about a year ago, we started uh, looking into console for service discovery. Uh, I've been working with Go for the last uh, four and a half years. Uh, and I noticed that you know, within, a, within a couple of lines of code, initial prototype was something like 350 lines of code. I was able to do something useful. Um, and, it was, uh, and it was scaling uh, quite well. So short answer is, well, you know, I wrote a load balancer because I could, and it turned out to be useful. So why would we want to have another load balancer in the first place? Because, I mean, these, these tools that have been around for a, a long time are actually, as I said, proven battle-tested. Uh, I think our application landscape has been changing uh, over, uh, over the last couple of years quite significantly. So we're looking at microservices, agile development, constant refactoring, and uh, continuous integration delivery. Um, if you're running in, in a cloud where you have to you know, pay per, per minute or per hour, you're looking at auto-scaling, you're looking at cost, and most, if not all, at maintenance time. So how long does it take you to actually manage all these different infrastructures and environments? So, if you start out with uh, you know, microservices uh, um, with static routing, uh, you know, like your Apache load balancer, uh, you, in essence, you look, like something, you look at something like this, where you have like, individual services, which, you, which each uh, serve, uh, let's say, a different endpoints, slash user, slash product, slash order. Uh, and you have, uh, um, uh, you have a static configuration file that sits in your uh, Apache or Nginx, which then routes incoming traffic um, to, your, to your backend services. Um, if you take then the, the step to a service registration, because uh, you, you are uh, sitting in a more dynamic environment, um, then you can simplify this a little bit, um, uh, because your services are now being registered in, in console. You can tools, uh, you can use like uh, or you know, etcd or Zookeeper, or, you know, any other environment. So this isn't uh, this isn't specific to console. Um, but then you can use a tool like console template uh, um, to extract that information and then uh, build a configuration file for the load balancer like HAProxy or Apache. So, however, what you've done now is that you've uh, now just moved the vital configuration which is essential to run your application from the load balancer itself to console template. So now it becomes important that um, when you upgrade the template, you actually do this in sync with the production deployment. Um, so, because you now have, you, you still have one moving part that is required to, uh, um, one additional moving part in addition to your application, which is required to run your application, which is uh, this specific piece of configuration. So, the interesting thing is that services already know which routes they accept because, I mean, you have to write a handler for them. So, there is somewhere, there is a servlet, there is a, you know, a, a, a handler function, you know, something that accepts uh, a request for slash user slash product. Um, so your service and your application already knows um, which routes it accepts because you have to write code for that. So if we were able to push these routes into the service registry along with uh, the host port information that you're registering itself, um, then we would have all the information that's necessary to build a routing table. And in short, that's all that Fabio does. So I could stop the application presentation right here because this is the main, the main core or the main feature of Fabio. The service tells the service registry, I'm listening on this address, this, this IP address, this port, and I'm serving slash user and slash product. So and then Fabio just extracts this information from console, builds a routing table, and that's all you have to do. So um, console. Um, Unfortunately, it still doesn't support uh, um, metadata or freeform metadata in, uh, um, uh, along with the service registration. So we have to use uh, um, somewhat, you know, the, I think you know, nowadays accepted hack 
uh, to put stuff into the tags, um, which means that for, uh, um, in order to use Fabio, um, you just add a tag that says URL prefix dash, and then you put the host and the path of that specific uh, um, of the specific path that your application is serving in there, and this is enough for Fabio to detect which applications uh, or which uh, routes your your service actually expect. Um, so the URL prefix tag hack has a has a couple of advantages. So for one, it's an atomic update with the service registration. So if you would use a KV store, you would have to do two calls. Um, it would not make it simple for third-party applications like Registrator. Uh, to use the same thing because it would have to kind of simulate that behavior. Um, there is no cleanup, lingering elements in the, in the KV store that you would have to remove. Um, so this, this all makes it easier. So what does that look like? Um, so you have your three services, let's say service A, service B, service C, which are all running on different IP addresses, different ports, and each of them is registering one tag. Um, and then Fabio just extracts this information, in essence just flips this around, and generates a, um, a simple uh, domain-specific language which says route add um, the host path and then the, um, the IP address. Okay, so let's demo this. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, so first I have a console instance running, uh, which can show you here. Um, whoops. Da, 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 da. So console is running, nothing here. Okay. So uh, let's start uh, uh, a service. Um, in this case, I'm calling it service A, which is listening on uh, localhost port 5000, and it announces prefix foo. Um, so the service is now registered in, why doesn't this work? The service is now registered in, uh, in console. Um, we can see that it has a green health check, so which is also something that Fabio needs. It will only include uh, services that um, are considered working um, in order to build the routing table. So now we can start up Fabio. Um, and as you've seen, um, I didn't run it with any, any configuration. So I just run the binary. It assumes that, uh, or it has sane defaults, which just means it, it assumes that it runs on a machine which has a local, uh, um, which has a console agent running as well. Um, it has uh, um, detected the configuration change in console and it has built a routing table based on that. Um, so what we can do now is that we should actually be able to query this. Um, uh, Query this endpoint, let's see, and we're getting a response from service A. So now let's start another service, um, which uh, also registers service, uh, um, the prefix foo, and also the, uh, the prefix bar, and let's call this service B. And why this is something that could be useful, I'm just going to explain in a minute. So this one is running on a different, uh, on a different port. Um, we can see that Fabio has, uh, um, has detected um, a route table change. Um, there wasn't really any noticeable latency here. Um, and when I query now the services, I get sometimes service A, service B. And the reason it's not flip-flopping you know, exactly one by one is that by default, it's using a random, uh, um, a random distributor and not round robin. So you can also tell it to do you know, exactly round robin uh, um, between the different instances. Um, but this way, it's uh, sometimes the one and sometimes the other. Um, so if I want to look at the, at the routing table that Fabio has built, there is also a user interface, which you can see here. Um, so we can see that uh, we have uh, service B listed twice, um, service A listed once, because service B and service A both uh, announce the path foo, uh, and service B is the only one which announces service bar. Um, the other thing that we can see is that um, uh, both service A and service B are now getting 50% of the traffic um, for, the, um, uh, for requests to service uh, to endpoint foo. Um, okay. So let's go back here. So the config language uh, that Fabio generates looks like something like this. And I, I, and I created uh, this in, in two colors. I hope nobody's green, red blind here. Um, so the first three lines are, are green, and the, the bottom two lines are, are red. Um, and what, I'm, uh, um, what I want to show with this is that the first three lines is the stuff that is auto-generated. So, but what happens if service A is actually announcing a route or a path that it shouldn't have done? 
So if you have a load balancer that has um, uh, an automatically generated routing table, well, the only way to fix it is if you deploy a new version of that service that announces the correct routing table. So depending on how quickly your pipeline runs, this can take seconds, minutes, hours. Um, in most cases, it is probably way too long, um, and it, uh, it then, uh, um, then that this is usable. So you need a way to actually manual uh, to make manual changes to fix broken deployments. And this is what the two red lines are there for. Um, you can uh, amend the routing table with, with some manual commands in the, same, uh, uh, in the same language, and that's also the main reason why I have uh, opted to use something that is human readable, because it actually humans that would have to write these, these kind of exceptions, um, so that you can fix a broken routing table until your next deployment is properly done. So, so said, the manual, uh, um, the manual overrides, as I, men uh, as I call them, they are mostly there to fix, uh, to fix broken deployments, uh, to make small tweaks uh, until you've uh, properly fixed your services. Um, but then there is also another, uh, another feature in there which allows you to do uh, um, dynamic traffic shaping, so, which means that you can uh, match against a certain set of services, let's say services that register an additional tag, let's say red or green, uh, uh, tomorrow or a date. Um, and then you can say, well, please route a certain percentage of the traffic to these number of services. So what Fabio does is um, it will route this percentage of traffic to these instances of services independent of how many uh, instances you've actually running. So if you say, please route 5% of traffic to the new version, it will route 5% of traffic to the new version, independent of whether you have one or 10 instances of that running. So you don't have to do any weight calculation, you know, which, how much weight do you have to assign to this specific instance or to spe this specific route. So Fabio will all do that all automatically for you. So what do we do with, with Fabio? And um, so I started out writing a list with you know, the things that we have done uh, most recently, both in, in my team and another team that's, that's also using Fabio within, uh, within eBay Classifieds. But for the most part, if I really think about you know, what we're doing with Fabio is that we forget that it exists. So now really think about that. You know, so how many pieces of your infrastructure do you actually have that are not constantly reminding you that they're still alive? So in our case, we have you know, like an ActiveMQ, which is ActiveMap. We have MySQL databases. We have file systems. Um, we have load balances which need to be reconfigured. So with Fabio, every once in a while, when there is something happening, we actually have to remind ourselves, oh, there is this single piece there that's also in the code path. That's also in the hot path where every single request of our platform runs through, but it's just completely invisible. It just runs, it's there, it works. Um, there isn't really anything uh, that we have to do to maintain it. So with this approach, which means that there is a load balancer which you don't have to configure anymore at all, ever. Um, adding new services becomes trivial. So, because the only thing that you have to do is you start up your new service. So if you want to add a slash product to endpoint or you know, an, an, uh, a support endpoint, the only thing you have to do is start up the service. You start up the application, it will register itself in console, Fabio will pick it up, you can immediately access it. As soon as you shut the instance down, um, the, uh, the route will no longer be accessible, Fabio will report a 404, and then that's the end of it. And this works in every environment. It works on my laptop, it works on our virtualized environments, it works on, uh, on the cloud environment, it works on uh, um, the physical environment, it works in any environment, because there isn't really anything special that happens there. Um, the other thing that we're doing with this is that um, we're making refactorings. So remember the case when, I, uh, when during the demo I started two services, service A and service B, which were both announcing the same, the same path. So in a normal environment, why would you want to do this? So you either have a user service that's serving user requests and your product service that's serving product requests. Um, but in our case, we have uh, services which uh, is our old search front end, and we want to migrate this slowly to a new search front end, but we don't want to do this in a, some kind of big bang migration. It has to be something like a drop-in seamless replacement for, uh, uh, for all the requests that we're doing, and we're doing uh, quite a number of requests there. So we just run the new implementation next to the old implementation. They're both announcing the same endpoint. Um, and we can then use the dynamic traffic shaping to say, okay, so let's put 5% of traffic there, let's put 10% of traffic there, uh, let's see whether it works, oh, it didn't work, so let's shut it down again, um, and 
we don't have to do anything special in any of our four or five environments in order to make something like this happen. Um, Markplatz, uh, which is, uh, um, well, everybody in the Netherlands knows Markplatz, I've been told, um, is, uh, uh, recently went through uh, a somewhat more uh, elaborate refactoring of one of, their, uh, one of their services. So they actually registered, they, they took one front end service and registered every single HTML page that this service was serving so that they could migrate um, to a new implementation of this on a page by page basis. So they could really just uh, move one page at a time, slowly seeing whether it was working, and then if it wasn't working, then they could just switch back. Uh, and it, they could test this on their local machines in every environment, and then they could also do this like this in production. Okay, so this has been the story with, with Fabio for, um, or since September 2015, when this, uh, when this more or less went live. Um, what I've been working on for the last couple of weeks is uh, um, uh, something that is called um, dynamic certificate stores. Um, so command line arguments, that's something like a nice, uh, uh, a nice giveaway as well. Um, but this is something that, that I've pushed live uh, um, today. So with uh, version 1.2, or <clears throat> what I've added is uh, dynamic certificate sources. One of the shortcomings of the current Fabio implementation is that if you actually want to do SSL termination on Fabio as well, um, then there was only, uh, I've, uh, I've implemented it so that um, for every listener, for every IP address that something is listening, you can specify exactly one certificate. So SSL actually has a, a server name identification support. So you can run virtual hosts on an SSL connection, but for that you need to be able to specify multiple certificates. So since Fabio is, uh, well, the, the main goal for Fabio is to actually be a zero conf load balancer or something so which you do not have to maintain, um, dynamic certificate stores is something that, that, will make this, uh, um, that will make this easier to implement and it will sub also support server name identification support. So let's start with the command line arguments because that's simple. So um, you can, uh, uh, in addition to the environment variables, you can now also specify every, everything that's in the, in the configuration file as a command line override because for some people that uh, is apparently simpler. Um, and with the certificate sources, I've took the approach that um, there are, you need to tell Fabio where to look for certificates. So you can either specify a single file or you can specify a directory, you can specify an HTTP server, you can use the console KV store, or you can also use Vault. Um, this works for TLS certificates, which means the certificates that are actually being used for your SSL configuration, uh, for, for your SSL connection. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work for the client certificate authentication uh, certificates because the Go standard library just doesn't have a hook for reloading these things uh, dynamically. Um, but yesterday I filed, a, um, I filed a ticket. Let's see whether that um, leads to anything. Okay, so let's see what this, what this looks like. And let's hope that this works. Um, okay, so now in different glasses. Okay, so we've stopped Fabio. So now let's uh, run Fabio with, uh, with Vault um, as, the, uh, as the backend. Let's start, a, uh, let's start a Vault server. Um, and here I'm using the development server um, with a, a hard-coded uh, root token. So obviously this isn't how you should run this in production. Um, but yeah, for now I'm running it like this. Okay. Um, so then um, certificates are stored under secret, and then in this case it's Fabio certs, but that's configurable, but this is you know, what I've, I've used in the, um, in the example configuration. So I'm, I'm trying to find whether there's a certificate um, in the Fabio, for Fabio LB IO. Um, and I can also see um, whether there are any certificates under this path. So nothing is there. Um, so let's start um, Fabio with um, the vault address uh, of, the, of our vault server. Let's give it the vault token. Um, then we have to configure a certificate source um, because the idea is that you configure a source and you can use it for multiple listeners. This is why they're disconnected. So the certificate source has a name. In this call, I call it cert. It has a type, which is type vault. And then you have to give it a path where to look for certificates. Um, the current implementation is doing polling. I had a, uh, um, had a talk with uh, Jeff, the vault guy, yes, 
a um, couple of minutes ago on how we can improve this so that in case you're actually running 500 Fabio instances and you're, you're, you're not killing your vault server instance. Um, so, but I can, I can tweak this a little bit. So for now, um, if you're using vault, it will use polling. If you're using console, it will just do the regular um, long poll. Um, then um, we're starting a listener, uh, again, on port 99999, um, um, and we're telling it to use this certificate source, which will immediately make it an HTTPS, uh, um, uh, an HTTPS listener. So, and for the purpose of this demonstration, so I've also used the round-robin uh, distribution. So um, Fabio starts up. Um, and so far, it, reg uh, it registers that these services, uh, um, these instances are here, uh, the, the services are there, but it doesn't have any, any certificates yet because there was nothing in the vault. Uh, in vault. So let's see what happens when we try actually try to access this as HTTPS. That should fail. Yes. Because, okay, so I... I hope this fails because of this curl dash i dash hps fabio lb dot io one two three foo fabio lb dot io that works. Yep. So Fabio says there are no certificates configured. Uh, this thing should actually fail. It did. Demo time. Um, so let's put some certificates into, uh, into Vault. Um, and the way I'm doing this is that I'm saying, okay, so please create an entry uh, fabiolb.io under a secret Fabio certs and add uh, um, two key value pairs here. So the one is called cert, and this name is important. Um, and then use the contents of this file, which is just a plain text file, a PEM certificate. And then do the same thing for, for key. Um, to put the key file there. So if you have only one file which has the, um, the certificate and the key in PEM format concatenated to each other, you can also put this just in the cert file and it will, it will work as well. So um, I've now stored the, um, the certificate in, in Vault. Um, and if I want to read this, um, I get uh, the certificate and the private key. And Fabio has uh, determined or has found the certificate, so FabioLB.io is now actually being uh, um, accessible. So let's hope that this works. Still doesn't work. Still doesn't work. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Okay. So service certificate says it's fabiolb.io. So I'm assuming that there's something with a uh, um, um, with a DNS cache that's messed up on my machine. Um, but that's at least so now it's working. Um, so let's remove the entry again. Let's do a delete. You can see nothing is there. Certificate store is empty. So if we do the request again, we get um, an SSL error because Fabio will tell us there is no certificate. So this now allows you to um, actually manage certificates um, on the fly. You can just load them into whatever certificate or whatever you're using for certificate store. So if you're using the path uh, certificate store, you could just use you know, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, you know, whatever distributes files across your, your network, and Fabio will just pick them up. Okay, so what's next? Um, there's one request out there uh, for someone who wants to run Fabio in front of uh, a ton of um, long-running WebSocket connections, and for this, Fabio actually runs out of uh, um, ports when it's trying to make uh, connections to the backend. So we'll add some uh, IP address uh, um, pooling so that you can specify which IP address to use as, as source IP addresses so that you actually can have 100,000 or 200,000 WebSocket connections on this. Um, the other thing is that uh, I want to refactor this URL prefix tag. While it has been quite useful, it is in, its, in its current form, it's a little bit limiting. And why that is, I'm going to explain in a minute. Um, and then there was another uh, um, long-standing request, which was you know, one of the things that came uh, right from the get-go, was, okay, so when are you going to support additional backends like you know, Mesos, Marathon, um, the Docker API, Swarm, Kubernetes, and so forth? Okay, so let's start with the URL prefix tag. Um, URL prefix tag is, is very simple. Um, it's URL prefix dash and then it's host slash path. Um, that's all you would have to do. But it's quite inflexible because it's limited to URLs only. 
Um, so there is a um, there is a ticket in uh, uh, for console to um, support generic metadata, and in this ticket, um, someone mentions, well, you know, why don't you just use this RFC, I think 1464, um, which is used for DNS TXT entries to put arbitrary metadata there, and that sounds actually like a uh, like a good idea in order to do this um, to um, to go to a generic key value uh, approach. So. Other than being different, you know, what would this actually allow me to do? So after I went through the list of open and closed tickets, I think you know, these tickets would all be affected by this because it would actually allow me to, um, uh, to address uh, um, certain features that people have been requesting on a route-by-route -route basis because otherwise there would have to be global parameters which you would have to control via the config file, and this is something that I didn't really want to do. Um, so there were things like prefix stripping, which um, you know, I think you shouldn't do, but lots of people are still keep asking for, for doing this. Um, there, uh, um, uh, most recently, someone asked for, for a CRS support. Uh, um, others want to be able to route by path and a header that has been injected you know, by, some other, uh, by some other mechanism. Um, then uh, um, wildcard matching, case insensitive, insensitive path matching, um, the protocol-based re redirection custom status code. So a lot of stuff that I either didn't do or that I had to do uh, based on um, uh, based on global config parameters, I should be able to address with this. So the issue with the multiple backends, at least for me, is a little bit uh, is a little bit more more mixed because um, if you look at the landscape that we have out there, then we have uh, these environments like Mesos Marathon, we have Kubernetes, we have Docker Swarm, uh, where you have service registration and uh, you, you have a you have a service registry and you have a distributed key value store. So either a Zookeeper or etcd, which in essence contains the truth for the for the cluster. And if I if I look at what Fabio uh, what Fabio does is then it's mostly centered around this consensus that uh, um, that console provides. So the service discovery really is a nice is a nice feature, but. To be honest, that is the easy part. Um, so the, the key feature that uh, console provides for Fabio is this replicated, consistent key value store that serves as the truth for the entire cluster. This is where all the Fabio instances can connect to and can agree on, well, this is the truth. So if I would want to support additional backends, um, then, well, do I have to drag console along? You know, some people were complaining, well, you know, we already have this as a dependency, you know, why can't you use, you know, whatever is already there? So I will try to figure out um, whatever is possible uh, with this, um, but to me that, that was, uh, um, so far, it looked a little bit difficult. So, because what I want to maintain with Fabio is that it still remains the single binary, the zero conf, which you just copy somewhere, and you just run. And it also supports the manual overrides because it's absolutely essential, in my opinion, that you have this with an auto-generated uh, routing table. So there is a, uh, there's a pull request to support Google Compute Platform uh, already there. A friend of mine has, has implemented this, but he wasn't able to uh, support manual overrides because whatever he was using on Google Compute Platform didn't have a way to just where, where, it, he, was, he, where he would be able to store this. So this is why this has been sitting there for a while, because I've been trying to think about you know, how to solve this. And Fabio should solve the harder problems. It should allow you to just pick, OK, so this thing will just work. Uh, and then maybe if you want to write uh, um, an obscure plugin for, um, uh, the, or a plugin for, for some obscure platform that, that does service discovery as well, or your homegrown solution, then well, maybe you can just generate these, these uh, config commands. So as a step towards multiple, supporting multiple backends is that um, I'm going to provide an API to push routes into console, which you can already do because you could kind of uh, abuse the manual override feature for this because if there, are, if there is no service discovery, you can just generate the entire routing table yourself um, and then uh, uh, do this. So I want to make this somewhat more generic um, so that there is a specific place where you can put uh, additional routes uh, into console via uh, a standard HTTP API. Um, then I'm going to look into additional service discovery modules uh, and maybe also add uh, different KV stores. But that largely depends on uh, kind of requests. So the first thing I have mostly done, but for the rest I need more input. So if this is something that is actually uh, is matching a use case, is something that you would like to do, where you think, well, you know, this would actually make sense in my environment. So please find me after the talk. And let's have a discussion about uh, what this would look like in your environment so that I can learn better uh, about the, the things that you are actually using. 
OK. Um, at the end, let's have a, a quick look at some stats. Um, so uh, Fabio has written in, in Go 1.6. It's mainly written around the HTTP util reverse proxy. Um, right now, it's about 4,000 lines of code. But I th I'd say 3,800 about this is config management and tests. Um, the rest, the core function, the proxy functionality itself, is still so simple um, that you can easily look it up. It's, it's not more than 100 or 200 lines of code. Um, it has been in GitHub since September 2015. So as of two days ago, I've reached 2,000 stars, 120 forks, 110 watchers. Uh, I'm doing roughly a release a month. There isn't really a hard release schedule. It's more that when I look at the release history, that seems to be the rate at which I'm pushing. Um, but if there is a ticket open and I can fix it, then it's already, uh, it's already in master. A release just means that I've tagged it and I've built pre-built a binary and uploaded it to GitHub and to Docker Hub. Um, this has been in production since September 2015, um, serving these uh, three sites. Well, these are the ones that I know of, um, uh, because they're the ones from our colleagues. Um, so MacBots is the site you know, that everybody knows. Um, and they kind of you know, went ahead and just picked this up even when my team wasn't really ready to do this. And at some point, well, this is going to production. We've tested it. It just works. Um, so that was nice. And then through some, internal, uh, um, so through some internal stuff, I found out that the people in Italy are also using this. Um, so and they're also still quite happy about this. And my team, the AdMark team, is also using this. And combined, uh, we're pushing something like 15,000 requests per second through this thing. And so far, we can't really observe any additional latency. Um, we haven't really had any issues. Uh, any issue that we had so far was more or less related to something that was happening, not happening in the service properly. Um, from our perspective, it just works. And as I said, at least from my part, most of the time, I forget that it's there. Um, and that's it. If you want to look at the source code, um, this is where to find it. Uh, if you want to email me, this is how you can reach me. Um, if you want to see you know, one of my five tweets a year, um, then this is where you have to go to. Um, and thank you very much for listening, and I'm open for questions.